it looks like we are at about 6.30, so I think we can get started. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us here tonight. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, my name is Sarah Berquist, and I am the Extension Coordinator for the WasteWise program at WSU Extension Island County. County. And I am happy to be here and present for my coworker, uh, who is currently on maternity leave, but she snuck in on here. Uh, the first of the 2021 Our Earth, Our Home series. So um, I'm just helping her out and I'm happy to do so. Um, at the end of our program, we'll share a couple other things, a couple other programs that we're running. One of them is a sustainability series, and we'll have talks about two a month on varying topics from what is your food print to um, plastics in our environment and what is the current status of plastics and recycling, et cetera, here in Washington State, um, composting, and some of the sustainability and equity issues around waste, et cetera. And those will go from next week all the way into May. So that is what's happening. And getting back to our earth, our home. A um, little bit of housekeeping first. If you want to uh, speak, you want to unmute your microphone and I'll try and, and notice that and get to you. Uh, if you would like to react to something, there should be a little button down at the bottom of your screen that allows you to clap or smile or, or whichever you choose. There's also a chat box where you can post your questions. I've got a thumbs up from Patricia, so that's working. Uh, a chat box where you can post your questions and we will try and get them relayed to Patricia so she has a chance to answer them. Uh, Without further ado, I would like to introduce the program. Tonight's topic is Eco Style Tips from a Former Fashion Designer. So in the past, we would have all had a small closet with a few very specific items of clothing that we were to rewear frequently. Not so today. Today we have, instead of four seasons, four, we have over 12 seasons and maybe more. Uh, some studies say that people wear an item of clothing about seven times. This increase in clothing production in fast fashion has had a staggering impact on um, human, had a, had a staggering human impact, environmental impact, natural resource impact, waste impact. Um, and I am very pleased to introduce Patricia Townsend, who is here to lead us in our learning through this topic. Uh, Patricia started her career as a fashion designer after graduating from the Parsons School of Design. She went on to do design in New York City, uh, Italy, and Peru as a knitwear designer. Lucky for us, she decided she liked the natural world better than the design world. So we have her here. Patricia is a, an associate professor with Washington State University and is currently the head of the natural resource. She's a natural resource extension specialist based out of Snohomish County. And she leads research and outreach on many environmental issues, including climate change, green infrastructure, plastic pollutions, renewable energy, sustainable urban systems, and ecosystem services. And we are fortunate that because of her first career, she is particularly poised to address the issue of the impact of fashion here in her second career and with us tonight. Patricia? Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. So I grew up in, in Kansas. Um, and when I was 20, I went off to New York City to Parsons School of Design. 
got a Bachelor of Fine Arts in, in fashion design, and I worked for a designer for I was figuring out tonight full time for about six years before I realized this was just not going to be me the rest of my life. And I went back to school and then I eventually went to graduate school. And while I was in graduate school, I kept designing part time. It was a very lucrative way for me to work as a um, fashion designer part time and go to graduate school. Okay, she says I can sh screen share now. And this was something that I um, kept in my closet. You know, I felt it was like a skeleton in my closet for a long time. And it's probably, it was about a year ago that I gave a version of this presentation the first time and realizing that I have a very unique perspective because I worked in the design industry for so long and I would consider myself an environmental scientist now. And I am well aware of the damages from the fashion industry. So can you see my screen? You see my slide? Okay, mm -hmm. great. We're off to a good start now. Now, if I will advance, yes. Okay, now you see another slide. Okay, I picked this picture because this is very much who I am now. I wear clothing for protection. I don't really dress to be in press anymore. I want to keep warm. I want to be dry while I'm hiking. You know, I think about practical clothing now. I used to have four inch high heels. I don't anymore. You know, I'm, I'm a different person than I was, you know, when I was a, a fashion design student. And, you know, some people, you know, you may have that need to be practical and want things, but you may also want to, to look good. Um, so all of these, these words I have on the right, sun, wind, rain, water, heat, cold, wildlife, vegetation, and then more recently disease. These are all ways that we wear clothing to protect ourselves and it's important. But clothing is also a way, a means of communication. So this is the evening of the, um, when it had been informally announced that Kamala Harris was our vice president elect. And my husband was wanting to know why is she wearing a very flashy white pantsuit that stands out? Well, I pointed out to him very kindly, that's a nod to the suffragette movement. And here we have a woman finally being elected vice president of the United States. So yesterday when she was inaugurated, Kamala wore a purple I think it was a suit, a pantsuit. I'm not sure if it was a pantsuit or a skirt and, and jacket suit. But purple is also a nod to the suffragette movement. So it is very much a form of communication, um, a form of gender. If Kamala was a man, she would probably be wearing a tie in this formal event instead of what uh, this little tie right here. I learned in reading this article in the New York Times, it's called a pussy bow. And so Margaret Thatcher, uh, Prime Minister of the UK. That was something that she frequently wore with her, with her suits. So there's a lot of ways that we use clothing to communicate who we are and what we do. But most of us, myself included, we have way too many clothes. Uh, I'm going to have several political references in this talk. And uh, this quote here is from Ivana Trump an ex-wife of a certain former president of the United States. And it's from a book called Affluenza, the all-consuming academic. And that was something I read at the beginning of the pandemic. I had checked it out from the library. And this is, this is what Ivana Trump said. I go to Bloomington Hills to the fourth floor and I buy 2000 of the black bras, 2000 of the beige bras, 2000 of the white, and I ship them between the homes and the boat and that is the end of it for maybe a half a year when I have to do it all over again. So why anyone would need 6,000 bras in six months, I don't know, but it's a lot of bras. And clothing is expensive, or it really should be. Quality clothing is expensive. And to think about that a lot of people buy clothes and wear them a few times, as Sarah mentioned in her introduction, and then just throw them away. It's a waste of money. Um, because a lot of us work or have worked very hard for our money and to not get the value that we should be getting out of our clothing is really uh, important. 
So I wanna do a little bit about fabric, uh, fabric and fiber 101. So there are, are natural and synthetic, two different categories of fibers. So natural is grown from a plant. You can think of like cotton linen or something that comes from an animal. So wool, apaca, cashmere are examples of that. And it is biodegradable. So if you leave it outside or put it in your compost bin, it'll, it'll degrade. Um, and sometimes it is recycled. There's also synthetic fibers and those are usually made from petroleum. Um, polyester, nylon are examples. They're not at all biodegradable. They you know, can persist in the environment for years and sometimes they are recycled. So I have a picture here of two pairs of slippers that I own. So the one here that is on the left that I've marked natural was actually made on Woodby Island. Um, it is from sheepskin and, you know, keep my feet nice and cozy. And then the pair I have on the right, these are polyester slippers. So they are a faux fur, you know, kind of a leopardy print with a black, you know, faux fur fleece. And they're also very warm and cozy, but they're not at all biodegradable. And so what happens to them at the end of their life? You know, they're destined for a landfill probably once they're no longer wearable. Whereas these ones, now that I've been thinking about this, I wanna contact the, the company that makes these and say, you know, could I compost them? You know, I don't know, maybe I could, but um, something to think about. So everything has pros and cons. Um, the leather process is uses a lot of chemicals. So some might argue that that's better than, than the synthetic ones, but then other people would say, no, actually because of all the chemicals that are used in the tanning of the leather, it's not better. So there is a, a new company out that is making kind of a man-made leather that is a biomaterial. And so this is a leather that is not made from petroleum, but it's made from like a cultured lab grown cells, similar to the Impossible Burger, if you've heard of that. So that's something I find very interesting. And I learned about that in preparing for this webinar. So I, I thank all of you for for wanting me to do this because I learned so much in, in putting this together. So as Sarah mentioned at the beginning, our clothing is a huge, huge factor in environmental damage, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the, the social costs to the people that make our clothing, the amount of water that's used and polluted to make our clothing. And then that so much of our clothing is currently ending up in the landfill. Uh, this was a little over a year ago in, in 2019, Jane Fonda, the, the actor, was in Washington, D.C., and she was protesting, protesting for our nation's inaction on climate change. And she said that this red coat is the last piece of clothing that she will ever buy. Well, I'm assuming Jane Fonda has, you know, plenty of clothes, has a whole wardrobe full of beautiful clothes, and you know, she has advanced in her years, it's probably not going to be too much of a struggle for her to never buy another piece of clothing. For the rest of us, it may be a little bit harder. So I'm going to get a little bit depressing here for a bit and talk in, in more detail about some of these different environmental factors. And then from there, I'm going to go into what we do about them and be more positive. So the, the, the global warming piece, a lot of that from what the research I've found so far is over 60% is in the production of the fiber. So this is whether you're growing crops, crops such as cotton or linen, or whether you're using oil to produce polyester and other synthetic, synthetic um, fabrics. Uh, a lot of it is also in the clothing production. You know, a, a good amount is in the use of like how frequently that we wash our clothes, which we wash them probably much more than we actually need to. And then the afterlife. So there's, there's carbon emissions throughout the entire supply chain of producing clothing. The biggest piece being on the front end. So this is something where we could look at finding better ways to produce the fibers that we need for our clothing would help a lot. Uh, I have a, a colleague of mine that I used to work with. We became good friends. That is from Bangladesh. So I learned a lot about that country and working with him. 
Um, and it, it turns out that Bangladesh in particular is a country that's going to be dramatically impacted by climate change. And a filmmaker, Adrian Taylor, did a film there called 30 million. And the 30 million is referenced to the number of people that will be displaced by sea level rise in particular due to climate change. It's gonna lose 18% of its land. The figures I've heard on the clothing and textile industry is anywhere from eight to 10% of carbon emissions. So that's a lot more if you think about it than actually a, the amount of flying that we do. It's more than the aviation sector. So it's, it's a huge area, but it's also a huge opportunity that we can find a way to do a lot better. Bangladesh, ironically, is also a place where a lot of our clothing is made. Um, most of our clothing is primarily made by women. It's primarily made in developing countries because it can be made at a low cost and people are not paid very well to do that. And often they work in very poor conditions. Uh, this photo is from a factory and these people, workers in the photo are wearing masks, not because of the coronavirus, this is an older photo, but to protect them from the poor air quality in the factory and all the dust and lint that is flying around. So there's a long history of workers in the clothing and textile industry not being treated well. I found out about a uh, fire that happened in 1911 in New York City in which you had garment workers that were mostly immigrant women, also some children, and 146 of them lost their lives in a tragic fire. And the reason they lost their lives is because the fire escapes weren't you know, built in a way to allow people to escape. There was a door that was locked. A lot of people were trapped. And some of these th same things happen around the world today. So I could spend the entire time talking about the, the abuses and the, the social costs of the fashion industry. It is really, really bad. Uh, water pollution, there is a lot of water that is polluted. A lot of it is from dyeing of the textiles. A lot of textiles are dyed with uh, harsh chemicals, uh, heavy metals, but it doesn't have to be that way. Indigo, which historically was used to dye jeans and give that fabulous blue color, comes from a plant. So there is a small industry um, in a certain part of the southeastern United States where they're growing indigo again to make a natural indigo dye. It is more expensive currently to dye jeans without indigo than it is with the, the chemicals, but it's environmentally much better. Um, cotton, which a lot of our clothing is made from, is a highly water intensive crop. It takes a lot of water to, to irrigate it to get it to really produce. And uh, some of the research I found is that a, a t-shirt needs 700 gallons of H2O to produce it. And a pair of jeans needs 2000 gallons of H2O to produce it. So that is a lot of water. Uh, there's another way that water is factored in is that our clothing sheds microfibers. So if you have, and those are just small, tiny microscopic pieces of, of fiber, if you think of like lint and things like that, if it's from, from cotton or wool, it will naturally biodegrade. But if it's from a polyester or any kind of acrylic synthetic fiber, it's not going to naturally degrade in the environment. Uh, a lot of times it gets into the water system, gets into our streams, our rivers and our oceans and causes pollution. So in this picture here on the right, this is me and my young son who's now a, a teenager now. I'm actually wearing the sweatshirt that he has on now because he's outgrown it, so I'm wearing it. It's made from a recycled polyester and cotton. Uh, and so I'm getting a lot of use out of it because he wore it like almost every day for a while and now I'm wearing it every day. And it does have that synthetic fiber in it. And um, some of the other clothing that we're wearing in this, I think these pants I have on are synthetic. I think the jacket I have on is a polyester fleece. I mean, we love our fleece here in the Northwest. It keeps us warm and dry. And, but when we wash it, it's when it sheds microfibers. 
Um, so there is research on this. There's a fabulous film called The Story of Microfibers. It's about three or four minutes long. You can learn about it there. In terms of what to do, I have not come across research that really shows that the various filters and coral balls and guppy bags work the best. The best thing I can recommend is to buy less of your clothing that is made from synthetic fibers and then wash them less frequently. We live in the Northwest. We're going to need rain jackets. We're going to need nylon hiking pants that dry quickly, but just wash them less and also put them in the dryer less. Okay. Um, so to think about clothing utilization. So since 2000, um, we have bought a lot more clothes, probably about twice as much, which is what this black line is showing here. The amount of clothes that we've purchased um, and the clothing sales is this purple line. And then this turquoise line here, whoops, 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 wasn't ready to go. Um, is the utilization. And so that's decreased dramatically. You know, there's probably some clothing that's that's used, you know, less than 100 or 150 times, which is indicated on this graph. You know, a lot of people do not wear clothes very often before they discard them. So it's something that I think of as economic stupidity. And I've come across this quote that's been attributed to a few people. Um, one of them is Will Rogers. The other one is Dave Ramsey in this book, The Total Money Makeover. And it's, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. So it's not very commonsensical. You know, a lot of us, myself included, you know, we make impulse purchases. And then once we have it, we're kind of stuck with it. Uh, so some of the data I found from the World Resources Institute is the average consumer bought 60% more clothing in 2014 than 2000, and they kept each garment half as long. And only 85% only of textiles that end up in the landfill each year, and that's enough to fill 1.5 Empire State buildings. And so we have this very valuable resource that's ending up in landfills. This picture on the right, this was a cover of National Geographic uh, from just about a year ago, March of 2020, and uh, advertised the end of trash. You know, finding a way to take these very valuable resources that we are just throwing away and finding a way to use them. So the hope is, is to figure out how to make the textiles economy a circular economy so that when we discard something, something that is really so holy and so ratty that it does not have use as a secondhand garment to find a way to recycle that clothing. You remember the graphic that I showed earlier that a lot of the carbon emissions come from the actual fiber production. So finding a way to really get as much use as possible out of those fibers. Um, this graphic is from an organization called the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and they are working a lot on what's called the circular economy so that things are not thrown away, so that our clothing and other items are not ending up in a landfill, that they're used, and that we're getting as much life out of them as possible. So as a consumer, what we can do in this part of the graphic is that we can increase clothing utilization. So the clothes that we have by clothes that we love, clothes that are practical and wear them and love them and cherish them and take care of them. When they are no longer at a useful point, we need to find a way to recycle them. I am working with a, another professor at WSU that's a textile engineer and she's developed a technology to recycle cotton fibers. And so we're trying to figure out how to develop a supply chain that would recycle our, our cotton clothing. Uh, this is an example of a company that has done just that. Uh, it's called Team Mill, where they grow cotton, uh, they turn it into t-shirts, and they try and do this as a sustainable manner as possible. Then when you're done with this t-shirt, you return it to the, the factory, 
And then they recycle that cotton and they turn it into a t-shirt again. Uh, the picture on the right, this is also from that National Geographic of March, 2020. And this is actually a recycled wool garment that the designer is working on that's made from textile waste. So this is the direction that we're going in. There's a lot of people working on this, trying to figure out how you can get more out of our garments to really make them more sustainable. So making a circular economy. Okay, so we're not there yet. Um, like I mentioned, the, the sweatshirt that I'm wearing is a recycled polyester and cotton, but it's more common that you see clothing out there. Um, but it's not everything that we go and buy. So what do we do as consumers when we need clothing to keep warm and dry? And what do we do when we want to look fashionable? So I, this picture caught my eye in part because this person was wearing kind of a hybrid t-shirt. It looks like these are two different t-shirts that have been stitched together, um, you know, pulling off a very fashionable look. You know, it was it was uh, taken by a photographer during New York Fashion Week, which occurs a few times a year in New York City. And so there's ways to be creative and, and use what you have. Um, so here are some suggestions here on terms of how to be ethical and eco-friendly in your shopping. You wanna buy less and buy really smart. Be really conscious about what you're buying. Realize that you worked hard for your money and someone worked hard in producing that beautiful item that you're thinking about purchasing and buying things that you really need and that you really want and resist the urge for impulse buying. Um, look into renting clothes. I'm mainly working at home right now, dressing very casually. If I had to go to a special occasion, Based on what I've learned, I would probably rent a suit or rent an evening dress instead of buying something. Um, look into buying things secondhand. Uh, the things that you do buy, you know, try and find things that are upcycled or, or made with the recycled materials. So this picture here I have on the right, this is from a department store in, in London called Selfridges. And they are working with a fabric, uh, with a factory in Northern Thailand to take pants and deconstruct them and then make them into jackets. So this is a, a, an example of what would be called upcycling. And Selfridges, as it turns out, is really one of the leaders. I'm gonna show another example of that, of what they're doing. But before you go shopping and buy something, I want everyone to learn to think Stitch. So you're going to stop and you're going to think and you're going to inventory what you have. Like, you know, is this something I really need? And maybe the answer is no. Maybe you don't need it. Maybe you just want it. So talk with a friend. Consider your options. You know, is there something, a way to do it that you can get it without buying a new item? Maybe you can host a clothing swap. You know, there's lots of options out there. Uh, in terms of using what you have, you know, look at your closet, get help from a friend. One of the things I read about was uh, artificial intelligence. You know, Alexa may have the capability someday of you try on a jacket or a shirt and Alexa will say, well, I like jacket A better than jacket B and give you feedback on what you have, you know, how, how it looks better and do it in a voice that is not at all um, condescending or snooty or gets on your nerves to help you figure out what looks good on you. Uh, so this is department store in London, uh, Selfridges, they have a project called Project Earth. And so they're really working to try and do things more sustainable where they can, where you can resell clothes that you've bought there, you can get things repaired, you can rent. There's a lot of information on their website and they do ship internationally. Not that I'm promoting them at all, but it's just in terms of ideas of cool things that they are doing. I would hope that most of us, when we graduated from high school, college, whatever that we rented or the school gave us a, a cap and gown to use and those caps and gowns were used many times. That's the kind of item that's worn once 
And, you know, it's not a quality item, but having it be worn on multiple occasions, you know, you're getting the most use out of the work that went into making those garments. Um, vintage clothing. So I found an article in Vogue magazine and since 2000, the last 20 years, it has become much more of a trend for people at the Oscar ceremony to wear vintage clothing. So this was a, one of the earlier examples I did find. Uh, there was a few from, I think, the 1970s and even the 80s, but it seemed like from about 2000 going forward, that pretty frequently that someone was showing up in a vintage dress. So this is a, the actress Winona Ryder. She's wearing a dress from 1947, Pauline Trigère, which is a, a French designer and wearing, wearing vintage. So it, the, the Hollywood has made it much more chic to wear vintage clothing. And in preparation for this webinar, I asked Sarah to pull together a list of the vintage clothing stores that you have on Camano and Woodby Island. So you have no excuse of not knowing where they are. So there is one on Camano, several in Oak Harbor around Freeland Langley, lots of places that you can check out to see what's there. Upcycling. Um, for, for any of you that were in high school when I was Molly Ringwald, Pretty in Pink, where she took a couple pink dresses and stitch them together to make her own prom dress. You know, that's an idea of finding a way to reinvent and upcycle. And then also these uh, purple socks here. I think these could have been made from an old sweater. I don't know, but that is something I have seen is old sweaters made into socks and mittens. Um, so any of you paying attention to the inauguration yesterday, the mittens that Bernie Sanders was wearing got a lot of attention. And these mittens were made by a second grade school teacher in Vermont. They were a gift to him, I think about five years ago from what I read. And they're called Swittens because they were made from an old sweater. And I think they kept Bernie very warm on that day. And uh, this teacher in Vermont has been deluged for requests of more of these, of these Swittens but she has a, a job as a teacher, she has a family and there's no way that she can fill in the all the requests that have come in in the past 36 or so hours for more of these sweatings. Fast, fat, fast fashion is probably a term you've heard about and it's it's been part of what has caused this increase in clothing consumption over the past 20 years. It's really in the late 90s into the 2000s of when it really took off of having more and more clothing produced. But we wanna act and counter to that and think about slow fashion and buying just a few pieces that are high quality that you can mix and match and have in your wardrobe for years. So this goes along with the concept of a capsule wardrobe and thinking about what those pieces are that you can mix and match so here we have an example of a, a French wardrobe basic list of, of what items you would need in your wardrobe and how you can use those. And once you have these basics items, maybe you just need one or two things. Well, you probably don't even need one or two things a year, but maybe you would want one or two fashion accessories a year to update it, to make it look new and fresh or colorful or exciting or, or something to cheer you up. So when shopping, you know, think about the colors that you're buying, you know, buy colors that are going to be versatile and styles and fabrics that are gonna be quality and versatile and last a long time. I mean, it's these two people here on the left, you know, with their camel jackets and then their one, the, the woman has on a black dress probably. And then the, the man has on a, a black shirt or turtleneck and pants. You know, those are things that they can get a lot of use out of that they can wear for a very long time, as long as they take care of them. So it's important to learn to take care of your clothes. Um, I don't know why my computer's jumping. So color, you know, color, particularly here in the Northwest, when it's winter time and we have gray days can pick us up. So I don't wanna say you should just buy everything in neutral colors that are easy to mix and match. If you have a favorite color, if you love pink, if you love orange, you love yellow, you know, buy something that you really love in that color 
and and wear it because it can really lift your spirits. Um, having fun with patterns and florals. You know, I think this this dress here, you only see a tiny bit of it, but you can tell that it's just a beautiful garment that was made extremely well and is beautiful. And then the pattern behind uh, Carrie Washington, you know, that is a beautiful pattern as well. And so having something that you really like, that you really love is important. Um, thinking about clothing for how you change as you age and for different life stages. I know we have Gerilyn with us tonight and she recently had a baby. So, you know, one of the things is, you know, clothes, clothing that you buy if you're pregnant or if you've lost weight, if you've gained weight, you know, think about drawstrings, you know, having a really fabulous pair of linen pants that you can wear in the summertime with a drawstring that you can shrink in and shrink and grow out of, you know, thinking about how you can wear items for a very long time. And not necessarily if you are pregnant, go to a maternity store, you may be able to find clothing in a store that you can wear, maybe not your entire pregnancy, but it's something that you can wear at the beginning. And then maybe again, once you've uh, had, your, had your little one. Um, things that never go out of style, stripes. We have our bathing beauties here on, on the left side in their striped bathing suits from 1915, which is what people used to wear when they go swimming. And then we have a modern Italian woman here wearing stripes. So there's definitely things that you can wear for many years. Uh, one of the items that I love is, is leopard. You might have noticed that from the, the slippers that I showed earlier on, but this picture here on the left from the 1930s, I can't see it on my screen right now, but that picture, you know, was probably an animal fur. Uh, the one in the middle, also an animal fur, but this one from 2013 on the far right, that is a synthetic fur. So we've definitely changed about how we source our fabric and our fibers that we use for our clothing. And that is involving an even and better direction with, where we're not harming animals and the environment as much as we did. So I think it's important to really learn some skills. Um, looking at this list here on the left side where I have sewing, darning and mending, embroidery, knitting, crochet, quilting, rug making, macrame, trading skills. The only one on there that I've never done is I've never made a rug. I was very fortunate in that I had two very talented grandmothers. One of them was a phenomenal seamstress. And then the other one did a lot of crochet and um, embroidery, a lot of handiwork. And I, I, I like to do that type of thing. I, I realize that not everyone does. So that's why I have on here at the bottom trade skills. So maybe you don't like to do any of these things, or maybe you don't want to learn how to do any of these things. You probably have something that you're good at, whether it's gardening or baking or fixing cars. And, you know, find a friend, a neighbor, a colleague that you can trade with that can sew on a button for you and you can bake them a loaf of bread or something like that. There's ways to find that increased community and also to increase the longevity of our clothing. So clothing that you do have, you do want to care for it. And if you do care for it, it'll last longer. And if you have fewer clothes, it will be less work for you to keep track of them and care for them. If you have a closet so full and cluttered with shirts and jackets and sweaters, it's just gonna be a lot of work for you. So go through, figure out what you really love, what you really need and care for it well. Dry cleaning is uh, usually a very, uh, can be a toxic process. So try and avoid that. There are some cleaners that use less toxins, so you can look into those. In general, try and not to wash your clothes very often. You know, wash them less, wash them in cold water when you do wash them, and then use a clothesline. Now that's not really easy to do this time of year, um, but if you do have clothes that you cherish, you know, instead of putting them in the dryer, you know, hang them up to dry in your, you know, someplace in your house and they will dry within 12 to 24 hours, depending on what they're made of. And that'll help them last longer. Also, if they're made from a synthetic 
material which sheds those microfibers that I mentioned, you know, that will reduce the shedding of those microfibers. Um, if you do use a dryer, there's something called a dryer ball that will allow the clothes to dry faster. So you're going to lose, use less energy, less electricity. It's going to cost you less money. So really thinking about that. So Sarah sent me this picture from somewhere in Whidbey Island. I don't know exactly where, but you have these um, clothing donation centers called uh, the Big Blue Bin. And it's from a company called Northwest Center. And the little bit of scouting that I've done so far is that Northwest Center, the donations that you make into the Big Blue Bin, they sell to Value Village. Um, Value Village, there are not as many of them around as there used to be. There were some value villages in Seattle that have recently been closed. I know the, the one closest to my house, I live just north of Seattle, is no longer there. Um, and I, I've also been by Value Village and I've seen like huge bales of like clothing that are going somewhere. And so this is something that I want to know more about, about when you donate clothing and textiles, what happens to it? So I'm fortunate that I have an intern from WSU this spring that's gonna be working with me and the uh, professor who's a textile engineer at WSU to find out more about what happens to these clothing and textiles. When you don't want something, you can try and sell it. There's a lot of um, consignment shops around, there's online stores where you can sell you can look into trading with a friend, you can give it away, you know, donating it. So there's lots of ways that you can dispose of clothing that you no longer want other than throwing it and putting it in the trash. Especially if it's in good condition. If it's in good condition, you know, try and find someone else that would want it or need it or use it. So tips for everyone. Be informed. So all almost 60 of you that have shown up tonight you know, you're learning. That's, that's the most important thing is learn. Um, and learn to use what you have, see what you have that you can reimagine, reinvent, or it's like, oh, I totally forgot I had this. I really love this. Why haven't I worn this? Um, learn skills if you can. If you can't learn skills, learn to trade. Um, repair and reinvent. Um, think about renting. If you have a wedding or some sort of occasion coming up, you know, start looking now into how you could rent something for that event. I heard in something I researched this morning that people are even went renting wedding dresses now. Uh, shop secondhand. And then when you are buying, try and be really responsible about it. You know, think about what the fiber is, where the garment was made, how it was made, who made it. Give a lot of thought into making a purchase before you have it and think, you know, is this something I really need? Maybe the answer is no, you don't need it, but you really want it. Well, if you do really want it, just, just give it some thought. Um, buy quality, and once you have bought something new that you really want, care for it. You know, care for it, and think about how to recycle it at the end of life. There's a reason I have this picture here on the right. Um, this is me here in this kind of blue jacket. And then the skirt and these pink boots. So the pink boots, pink rubber boots, I got at a Goodwill. And then the skirt I actually got here in Seattle when I first moved here. I don't wear it very often, but I love it. It's kind of a Art Nouveau print. Um, and then the jacket that I'm wearing is fleece. You know, it was a kind of a cold spring day when we're out here walking around. And that's something else that I got at Goodwill. And the reason I'm showing this location is that we are walking on top of a former landfill. And thinking about there's probably a lot of clothing and textiles that were buried in that landfill. That landfill is located near Duval, Washington. It's a closed landfill, a King County landfill. Uh, the reason that I was there is I used to work on a, a project with poplar trees. And poplar trees, this is a grove of poplar trees, are really good about controlling the contaminants that would happen in a landfill. And the roots of the trees help prevent the, the contaminants from moving out of the landfill. 
So I show this because we don't want our clothing to end up in a landfill unless it really has to. So those Empire State buildings full of clothing that are going to landfills, we want to stop that. So the future of fashion. Um, one thing that happened during the pandemic is that there was way too many clothes for spring and summer 2020 produced and everybody was staying home. People were not going out to parties and weddings and events. They weren't going to work. And so a lot of things were not bought. And the way the fashion industry currently works is there's so much lead time, it creates a lot of waste. And so there's people looking into producing things that are just in time so that you order an item. And then once you've ordered it, somebody makes it real quick and ships it to you in two weeks. And so I, I read about those. Um, Love Local. I know I said I'd talk about my hat. My hat is made from alpaca. It was the alpaca uh, are at a farm in Kansas where I grew up. And so a very good friend of, of mine sent me this hat a couple years ago. And so then the yarn was, was the, the hair from the alpaca was spun into yarn and then it was handmade in Kansas and then shipped to me as a birthday present one year. So I love this hat, I love local and I know the local food movement is very big here in the Northwest. We wanna think about how we can translate that into our clothing. So farm to form or farm to clothing. Uh, 3D printing. Uh, that is something that designers are experiencing with. That's what the picture is here on the right side is a 3D printed garment. Uh, renting, I think there's gonna be a lot more avenues for renting clothing instead of buying. And I would say in general, Europe is so much further ahead of us than we are here in the United States. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which I mentioned earlier is doing the circular economy. They're doing a lot of work. They're based in the UK. The London Fashion College has a lot of sustainability initiatives for their students. There's an organization called Fashion for Good. It's based in Amsterdam. You can go to their website and you can do a virtual tour of the museum, which is very interesting. And then in France, this was just about a year ago, they enacted a law that for the circular economy. And that's basically banning uh, destroying unsold clothing. And that was something a few designers got caught doing is clothing that they didn't sell. They didn't want it to end up in the wrong hands to cheapen their brand. And so things are being burned or landfilled and it was perfectly good quality clothing or accessories that was being destroyed. And so France has banned that recently. Uh, I've got tons of resources here uh, fashion resources, you know, to, to share with you on, on the left here, I have a coworker who's basically Sarah's equivalent in Snohomish County. And these are shoes that she wears that I think are really fun. So I'm always excited when I see Heather, but I haven't seen her in a long time wearing these shoes. So hopefully someday soon I'll get to see Heather in these shoes. Um, tons of information that I've, I've started to collect over the environmental costs of the clothing and textile industry. And so what to remember is that, you know, if you are someone who really loves to shop, you know, try and think of other things that you can do so you aren't spending your hard earned money for things you don't really need or want. Um, nature is great for that. Go out, take a walk, a hike, uh, walk along the beach, um, do something, think stitch. So stop, think, inventory what you have, talk to a friend, consider your options, you know, host a clothing swap, and the top 10 tips I shared with you. So thank you. I think we have a little bit of time here for questions. Um, as those are coming in, I wanted to share this photo. I just made me smile that I, there's a few of these bra fences around the world. This one's from New Zealand and it's, it, it's yeah. a place where you can support breast cancer research. There's my contact information there on the bottom so anyone wants to follow up with me afterwards, you can, or you can talk, contact Sarah. She can be in touch with me as well. So I appreciate all of you showing up this evening and I'm happy to take any questions. I'm so, gonna stop sharing my screen. 
Uh, thank you very much, Patricia. That was wonderful. And uh, my apology for walking over anyone at the beginning. Um, I seem to have that sorted out. We do have some questions. Um, and I'll go through a couple of them and then see if anybody wants to pipe up and ask them verbally. And then we can go back to the questions. With some great comments. Um, one gal said she had a pair of linen drawstring pants that were 24 years old. And she gets compliments on them every time she wears them. Um, that's something I hadn't thought of about shopping for the long term, for the changes that you experience in your body through life. Um, one person asked, okay, get this question right. Um, what do you think the next eco-conscious craft movement might look like? Um, what materials might be available and useful in this way? For example, types of yarn and threads. And I can think of the leather um, material that, that you um, shared with us. This person is currently a knitwear and crochet designer and would like to start a company that focuses on more environmentally eco-friendly wear. Yeah, so you had sent me that question ahead of time, Sarah. And so what I think about the first thing that came to mind is Bernie Sanders mittens mm -hmm. and how the, the person that made those got like 6,000 requests for more mittens like that. So old, ugly sweaters that can be turned into mittens and slippers, you know, I, I think that's a perfect opportunity. And then the other thing is like any kind of quality fiber, you know, wool and cashmere, um, alpaca, anything that can be respun or the, the sweater can be dismantled and made into something else. I have a, a baby blue cashmere sweater that someone gave to me when I was in Italy. And so I'm in the process of deconstructing it. It's something I do whenever I'm a little frustrated and then I'm going to dye it a different color, figure out how to use natural dyes. And then I'm going to make it into something. So if you can find cashmere, I mean, that's, that's an expensive fiber and that's an opportunity. I, I found some really nice cashmere sweaters at Goodwill. And um, yeah, so lots of things you can do out there. Some of those beautiful old wool sweaters can be felted down and make something so simple as pot holders. Um, and of course, mittens too. Uh, a second question is, um, are universities, are fashion universities, for example, your Parsons School of Design, uh, are they having class or other schools, WSU, um, having classes related to this important topic? And following that, there's a, a second question. I'll let you hit the first one. Uh, that's something I've been wondering myself. I, I, I don't know. I just know the, the school I mentioned in, in London, the London Fashion College is really outstanding in that. I know Fashion Institute of Technology, which is also in New York City. I know they're doing a little work in that regard. There is actually a professor I've corresponded with that is now, I think, at North Carolina State that's working in sustainability and teaches courses in it. And so it is happening, maybe not as much as it needs to, but it is, it is around. And then the professor I'm working with at WSU is working on textile recycling. So it's, it's happening, it's getting there. Okay, great, great, that's good to hear. Um, the second part of that is um, how easy or hard would it be in the fashion industry if how hard easy I think I think they mean and this person might want to um, they could unmute and ask the question if I'm not getting this right uh, how hard or, hard or easy would it be in the fashion industry if people were interested in creating and selling upcycled clothing I think there is a demand for it now I think over the past I would say a year to year and a half that people are becoming much more aware that this is an issue and that, um, you know, to buy something and wear it a few times and then just to 
throw it away and have it end up in the landfill. It's just, it just, just doesn't make sense. And so it doesn't make sense. And then for anybody that cares about water quality and climate change and different environmental factors and clean air and people working for living wages, you know, it really doesn't make sense. And so figuring out how to come up with a new system. And one thing I didn't, I didn't mention specifically is that I just finished reading this book. I put it in front of my face. Maybe you can see it. No, you can't see it. It's not showing up on my screen. Anyway, it's called Fashionopolis. And it's by Dana Thomas. And uh, it's just out in the past year or so. And she's, she's done a phenomenal job of researching it. She doesn't quite get into the environmental cost as, as much as I would like, but she, she's where I got a lot of the information on some of the, the new technologies that are coming out. So I think there's tons of opportunities out there. I think it's the direction we're moving um, and you know, consumer demand is part what will move it, but having people doing innovative, creative things that are generally a better way. Uh, that's one of the, the good points here. Um, Jeannie says that she saw this fence when she was in New Zealand, uh, the bra fence. The bra fence. Uh, she means. Um, and uh, having a small house and a small closet is really good for um, kind of requiring you to minimize your wardrobe and really think about the pieces that you bring in. Uh, there are a lot of good suggestions here in the list about places to donate. Yeah, Sarah, do you know how to save the chat? Mm -hmm. So if you look here, there's, there's a file uh, and then to the right of that are three little dots. I just found save the chat. Yeah, you can save the chat. So that's a way to, to save um, information that people are typing in. I try not to mention specific organizations or companies that are really doing outstanding things, but they are, are out there because I'm, as a uh, employee of WSU, I try not to promote. I'm just trying to share information that our current system is extremely polluting and that there's better ways and start looking and you will find them. There is no shortage of different options out there. Um, one of the things that I didn't get a chance to share with Patricia when I sent her a picture of the big blue bin, um, and this is something that her intern might want to look up as well. One of the things that you can do with items of clothing or textiles that are no longer wearable, but you know maybe they're stained or they're torn, ripped, and this can be you know, your clothing, it can be curtains, it can be sheets. You can put them in a plastic bag, mark that bad bag thread cycle, instead of recycle, it's thread cycle, and you can put that in that blue bin. And that is then used to make um, insulation, mattress filling, padding, um, shop rags, that kind of thing. But it does bring up the question of where does this go and are we inundating other countries, developing countries with all of our cast offs in such a way that it's overwhelming them. So we'll be interested to hear what your intern finds out about that, Patricia. But that is one place to put those clothes that are no longer wearable um, that could potentially be put to good use. Is anybody else having a difficult time donating, donating their old clothing through this COVID um, experience? Either because thrift stores, secondhand clothing stores are overrun or they're afraid to take it. Yes. Okay. Um, you might, if you get a chance there, it looks like there's a couple places on the chat that will allow you to still take things. I know that various thrift stores, some of the ones that Patricia posted, um, if you call them, go call them before you go there because sometimes they get full and they won't take any more for the day. Sarah, I see a question about my slippers. Ah, okay, where, where did that go? Go ahead. 
someone I wanted to know about my slippers. So I think I might have bought them at the Pike Place Market. So this is the second pair that I've had. The first pair, I eventually wore them out. I mean, I wear them a lot, especially now. <laughs> um, Pie Place Market, but the, the business, probably if you type in like um, Sherling Shipper, Slippers, Clinton, Washington, it'll, it'll come up without me having to say the name to act like I'm promoting the company. <laughs> But it is, I mean, I'm the, some of you, I'm assuming, live on Woodby Island. I mean, local, having something made in your community, I mean, that's not that common nowadays. Mm -hmm. they, their, their website does say that they source all of their leather and shearling from around the United States. So it's United States materials that they're using. Um. One person points out that there are also several buy nothing groups on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I know that I've seen people on the buy nothing South Whidbey particular Facebook that said, I have some clothes, does anybody want them? And they're able to do a, a no contact fork exchange. Um, often also there are shelters that need clothing. So that's another option. Um, Sometimes organizations that collect clothing for schools, if you have anything that might be still considered stylish for younger folks. Uh, let's see. Uh, one person wanted to know what to do with fabrics at the end of their life. And again, that's, that's where that thread cycle bag can come up to go into that blue bin. Um, Patricia, what do you think about cotton or natural fabrics versus synthetic fabrics and cotton in particular, which can be so um, impactful on the environment. Um, yes, I would say cotton, if you can, if you're going to buy cotton, try and buy organic cotton. Uh, there is someone that's growing cotton that comes in different shades. So the natural cotton is a tan or a light green. So if you can buy a cotton that isn't dyed, so that is, you know, reducing your environmental impact. And, you know, buying, if you're gonna buy a t-shirt, you don't need a uh, hundred t-shirts or 50 t-shirts. Maybe you don't even need 10 t-shirts. You know, if you buy one cotton t-shirt that you really love and you're gonna wear for several years, you know, it's, it's, it's the quality, not the quantity. Um, do you know of any fabrics that are both um, natural and vegan besides uh, the, the main four, thinking cotton, linen, bamboo, and hemp? Hmm. Anything else? No, not that I can think of. It sounds like there might be more coming along though. There might be more coming along. And then if you go into the Fashion for the Good website that I mentioned, they have a page in there called Resources. And I found some really interesting documents in there about man-made biomaterials. And so this is like the, the leather that is cultured in a lab. It's not actually leather. It's made to look like leather and cultured in a lab. And so that would be vegan. And then recycled um, cellulose materials. So if you think about rayon, that comes from trees sometimes. So that would be another plant-based material. Um, but making those more in a recycled or lab situation. Silk is another one that they're doing, find out how to, to kind of make silk-like material in a lab. Um, so that would be another, that's an animal one because the actual silk must die in the process of silk, but a, a bio-manufactured silk-like material, you know, the silk moss don't die. So there's things out there. There's, it's really cool when you start to go into the tunnel and the 
the number of websites that I have bookmarked. Uh, I guess I, I do this a little bit here and there. It's kind of a, a hobby like thing for the past year or so. Whenever somebody asks me to do a, a talk on this, you know, I, I come across another treasure trove of information. It's like more and more. And so now we're at the point where I have an intern from WSU this semester that's really going to help us make some progress. And then I'm working with two colleagues at WSU and we're gonna submit a grant hopefully this year to try and get some funding to work on this more, the, the recycled part. And then, you know, to get people involved because right now I could say, well, give me all of your cotton t-shirts that are stained and worn and your sheets that are, are threadbare and we'll make them, recycle them into cotton new cotton fiber and I'm like well it can't happen yet but hopefully sometime soon we can figure out how to do that well um just one more comment that that um someone mentioned for considering and this includes cotton as well somebody said flax was another option but to, to think about the fact that um some fibers are natural but the processing of them can be very chemical intensive um so um patricia maybe in a year you can come update us with what you discover with your uh intern yep and your other professor at WSU. yep um, be happy to i it is past our time so i would like to thank everyone for participating i'd like to thank patricia so much for presenting i learned a lot and this was wonderful um, anyway, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us, and uh, I think we're good. We will be posting this on the extension website if anyone wants to review it. All right, thanks to everyone. <laughs>